Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today we are covering chapter 10 of the environmental and natural resource economics video series. As always, I'm working off the ninth edition by Tom Tiedenberg. I've provided a link in the video description where you can check out the Amazon page if you want to buy the textbook. And in chapter 10, we're talking about land. And so Really, this, this course has talked about different resources that can be used. In previous chapters, you know, we've talked about either it's a air as a resource, a water as a resource, maybe timber. But in this chapter, we're talking about land. And land, of course, is in fixed supply. So a quick introduction. When talking about land, topography matters, of course. But so does its location, especially since in contrast to many other resources, land's location is fixed. It matters not only absolutely in the sense that the land's location directly affects its value, but also relatively in the sense that the value of any particular piece of land is also affected by the uses of the land around it. So we, the best example I can give you is you know, think about real estate, think about, you know, the, the fundamental rule, the uh, property's value, the three th factors that in influence a property's value are location, 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 like location is absolutely important and relative to other areas around it, it influences that use and its value. And it's the same thing for land in general, the thing the the the, the community in the area around that respective piece of land will influence its overall use and its overall quality of the environment. Okay. So as with other resources, markets tend to allocate land to its highest valued use. Each of the three functions in the graph to the right are bid rent functions, which records the relationship between distance to the center of the town or urban area and the net benefits per acre. And so I really like this because it kind of illustrates the really, it, it's a great way to, to communicate this statement right over here. So as with other resources, land is allocated to its highest valued use. And so you're comparing three functions, residential development, agriculture and wilderness. And of course, residential development and society standards receives the most net benefits overall, it creates it creates a lot more jobs, it creates a lot more benefits in housing, right. And so the bid rent function is much steeper than to say agriculture, and especially wilderness, which wilderness is just from an environmental perspective, right. So what this does is it, on the y axis, you see you have your net benefits per, per acre on and on your x axis, you have this distance to center. So zero would be the center of the city. And at the end, so at this point C, that's the farthest point of in this urban area, right. And so it makes sense. So uh, between the distance of zero and a, uh, the this this area over here would be residential development between a and b, the area would be agriculture and between b and c, the area would be wilderness. And so the intersection points between if we could kind of strip away the wilderness and just focus on the, the residential bid rent function and the agriculture bid rent function, the intersection point is where residential development stops and agriculture starts. And then the intersection point here at b where the agriculture bid rent function intersects with the wilderness bid rent function, that is where uh, agri the agriculture land stops and the wilderness starts. Okay, so a market process that allocates land to its highest valued use would allocate the land closest to the center to residential development, a distance of A, then agriculture would claim the land with the next base tax, uh, best axis, so A to B, and the land farthest away from the market would remain wilderness, so B to C. This allocation maximizes the net benefits society receives from the land. Now, talking about land use conversion, how, what are some of the influences that that really influence that conversion from either urban to agriculture, or agriculture to urban or a wilderness to agriculture. So conversion from one land use to another can occur whenever the underlying bid rent function shifts. Two sources of the conversion of land to urban uses in the United States stand out. So in the US and developed markets, you're seeing a lot of conversion from agriculture to urbanization. And so the two really big trends are increasing urbanization and the industrialization rapidly shifting upward the bid rent function for urban land. So you'll see that. Um, so essentially, this residential development over here, it, it, it continues to push up the uh, residential development, whereas with the agriculture, the overall value of that will actually fall. And so as the agriculture bid rent function drops a little bit, you'll see that it moves farther and farther away. So if the intersection point is at here, so if this bid rent function falls to here, well, then that creates more area used for uh, urban or urban. Uh, development. And then the second trend is rising productivity of the agriculture land. And that that essentially means that, you know, you don't need as much agri agricultural land to produce the same amount of food that you need, 
right? So that with the rising productivity, the amount of land demanded by the agricultural industry falls as well. Now, in developing markets, the an opposite shift is occurring. So countries are witnessing the conversion of wilderness areas into agriculture. So not an outward shift or not a, a decline in agricultural demand, but an increase in agricultural de demand. So relative increases, so a shift up in the bid rent function for agriculture could result in the following. So and, and the, the reasons why this, this kind of uh, move towards the wilderness to agriculture is A, domestic po the, the domestic population has grown significantly, and so that increases the domestic demand for food, the opening of ex export markets for agriculture, increased the foreign demand for local crops, and it's beneficial for this developing market for their FX reserves to be selling these crops uh, in foreign markets. Also, new planting or harvesting technologies that lower the cost and increase the profitability of farm farming help a lot of these poorer countries enter the agricultural business because there are some initial capital costs, and if those costs drop, then it's much more accessible even for the middle class and lower class. And also, lo lower agriculture agricultural transport costs due to, for example, the building of roads into forested land. Okay. So what are some of the sources of inefficiency uh, in use and conversion when it comes to land? So we shall consider, consider several sets of problems associated with land use inefficiencies that commonly arise in the industrial countries. There's sprawl and leapfrogging, inca incompatible land uses, undervaluing environmental amenities, the influence of taxes on land use conversion and market power. So sprawl and leapfrogging are probably one of the most important concepts that you should kind of take away from this video. So two problems associated with land use that are receiving a lot of current attention are sprawl and leapfrogging. From an economic point of view, sprawl occurs when land uses in a particular area are inefficiently dispersed rather than efficiently concentrated. So essentially what that means is, say for example, an entire country is made up of two areas. And so one area has residential housing and another area is agriculture. If someone builds a, a residential home in um, the agricultural area, that's considered a sprawl because there usually what happens is you know, zones, and you'll talk about zoning laws. A lot of times you'll hear this this word zoning laws, right? And really that's to kind of maintain these concentrated pockets of different uses for society. So there's neighborhoods, and those are, you know, residential areas. There's, you know, the downtown district and, you know, uh, commercial areas. There's maybe the industrial areas and the outskirts of the town. And so these different areas, if they kind of change and there, there's residential homes jumping up in industrial areas. That's called sprawl, right? And the related problem of leapfrogging, which refers to a situation in which new development continues not on the very edge of the current development, but further out. So, say for example, you know, we the the city has has grown about five kilometers out, but then someone decides to build a property six kilometers out. So there's that extra distance between you know the fifth and sixth kilometer, and that's called leapfrogging. They're not following you know the economic point of view, the efficient efficient location of where they should be building. Okay, so several environmental problems are intensified with dispersed development trips to town to work shop play or become become longer. So longer trips not only mean more energy consumed, but also frequently they imply a change from the least polluting modes of travel such as biking or walking to automobiles, a, a much more heavily polluting source. So think of it this way, you can, there's this discussion, you know, as you kind of move out of your parents home, are you going to move into uh, an apartment on the outskirts of the town or in downtown? right? If you move in downtown, then you don't really need to buy a car because you can bike or walk. But if you move on the outskirts of town, then you probably need to buy a car in order to get to your job in the downtown region. And so that's really what happens when you're talking about leapfrogging. You know, if you move that mass of people further out, then the amount of energy spent getting to their jobs, which are usually in the downtown core, they consume much more energy and are viewed as polluting. Let's examine the incentives faced by developers. So why why does leapfrogging occur? Well, one that can be found in pricing public services. New development beyond the reach of current public sewer and waste systems may necessitate extending those facilities. So who pays for that? If the developer is forced to pay, then they have to consider this as part of the cost of locating. That means they have a steeper, steeper bid function, right? But if they don't account for this cost, then they're, they have a flatter bid function and they move further out. So the public infrastructure problem essentially states that when you are going to consider leapfrogging and moving into this really kind of rural area, 
you know, you have to extend basic facilities, roads, maybe sewer systems, maybe energy lines. Who's paying for that? At the moment, in a lot of regions, you know, the public is paying for that and the taxpayers are. So that's not part of the cost consideration when that developer is considering that region. If it was, and if you, if the society did account for this public infrastructure problem, then the bid rent function would be steeper, right? And so therefore, they would have to move closer in order to prevent and avoid th those costs, which would then they would have to pay. And it can be very expensive. So when development costs are being subsidized by all taxpayers in the metropolitan area, both the developers and potential buyers of the newly developed property find living farther out to be artificially cheaper, right? So with public costs, the bid rent function is steeper, whereas without it is, is flatter. And so you'll see that if we add hypothetically another curve over here, the intersection point between the two curves, the without public costs, the distance to center is efficient, like in, a, in equilibrium further out than the bid rent function with public costs. Okay, if transportation costs are inefficiently low due to subsidies or any uninternalized negative uh, externalities from travel that may not have been internalized, a bias will be created that inefficiently favors more distant locations. Finding examples of inefficiently low transportation co costs is not difficult. You know, so say for example, free parking. This is a really big consideration. So if your employer offers you free parking, then really you're saving on that, and so the full cost of transportation for you is not real. It, they're, 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 it's kind of a subsidy in the sense that, you know, you, you buy your car, you're paying for gas, but you don't pay for parking. In an ideal world, in a purely economic world in theory, you know, that's part of your transportation costs. You have to pay for parking that car in the urban area and then bringing it back home. Right, and so you can go go beyond free parking. Some some companies offer subsidies on you know transportation costs, so they'll pay for your gas. Well, then really the 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 bid rent function is very flat, and therefore you know it's efficiently and in, in the eyes of this uns, this subsidized cost, it is better to be further away versus closer. When really when you account for those negative externalities. So what about incompatible land uses? land value will not only be affected by its location, but also nearby land and how it is used. The interdependency can create inefficiencies. Negative externalities are rather common in land transactions. Many of the costs associated with a particular land use may not accrue exclusively to the land over, owner, but will fall on the owner of nearby parcels. For example, houses near the airport are affected by the noise in neighborhoods near a toxic waste facility uh, by the noise and neighborhoods near a toxic waste facility may face higher health risks. So this is a, a, a perfect example. I actually know someone who lives beside an airport, you know, like they've gotten used to it, but it's an externality. It is an externality for the airport. They're not really accounting for the cost of all that noise that's being created. Whereas for the owners and the, in the neighborhood surrounding that neighbor, that uh, airport, they have to really deal with that noise. And so when you talk about that, you know, and you talk about zone laws, that's what kind of prevents, you know, a home ending up in a, in an industrial area where, you know, there, there's a toxic waste facility and all of a sudden, you know, you have all this smell that might, you know, ruin your day. And so one traditional remedy for the problem of incompatible land uses involves a legal approach known as zoning. Zoning involves land use restrictions enacted via an, an ordinance to create districts or zones that establish permitted and special land uses within those zones. Land uses in each district are commonly regulated according to such characteristics as type of use, such as residential, commercial, and industrial, density, strike, structure height, lot size, structure placement, and among others. And Again, I'll speak to this as well. I, I I always love watching like you know these these TV shows about you know home flippers and all that kind of stuff. And you always hear these these issue that these home flippers have. It's like oh we need to go to the zoning board to get this approved and all that kind of stuff. Well, those zoning laws were initially put in place to protect that. And so if they are flipping a home and turning it into a store, then from a purely economic point of view, they're they're acting in an inefficient way. And that's called rent seeking behavior, which we talked about in another chapter. So many of the beneficial ecosystem goods and services associated with a particular land uh, use may also not accrue exclusively to the landowner. Hence, that particular use may be undervalued by the landowner. 
So another really big inefficiency in the land market and when valuing land is undervaluing the environmental amenities. Consider, for example, a large farm that provides both beautiful vistas of open space for neighbors. The owner would be unlikely to reap all the benefits from providing the, the vistas because travelers could not always be excluded from enjoying them, despite the fact that they contribute nothing to their preservation. So this is the free rider theory and seeing that, okay, you know, we're not going to pay you for these vistas, but they're very beautiful. And of course, they're going to offer a lot of biodiversity to the local species in that area, right? But the value won't accrue to the owner on, on the bottom line. It won't pay his bills, right? And so that's another externality, a beneficial externality that is not internalized in the system. So one remedy for environmental amenities that are subject to inefficient conversion, a due to uh, the presence of positive externalities involves direct protection of those assets by regulation or statute. So take wetlands, for example, wetlands help protect water quality in lakes, rivers, streams, and wells by filtering pollutants, nutrients, and sediments. And they reduce flood damage by storing runoff from heavy rains and snow melts. So when talking about, you know, wetlands, there are a lot of farmers who have on the outskirts of their property, these different wetland areas. And so they really, they don't really value those areas, they see them as okay, you know, it's a marsh, and I can't really build or grow anything there. So I'm just going to leave it alone, right? But from society's point of view, and especially from the environment's point of view, that offers a that's a filtration system that offers a, a way to cleanse the the um, the water and the runoff that is in that area. And so once again, that farmer is undervaluing this environmental amenity. So it's very very important to understand that this is a huge consideration. It is an a, a, benefit. It is an externality. It is a positive externality that is not being accounted for. So what about the influence of taxes? Many governments use taxes on land and facilities on that land as a significant source of revenue. However, taxes also affect incentives to convert land from one use to another, even when such conversions would not be efficient. And so the two examples are the property tax problem and the inheritance tax problem. So the, a property tax has two components, the tax rate and the tax base. The tax base, the value of the land, is usually determined either by the market value as reflected in a recent sale or as estimated by a professional estimator. Now consider a piece of farmland in a region that has undergone significant urban development. The pressure to convert it to urban land increases due to higher taxes which need to be paid and therefore lower inc net income. If the tax does not fully reflect the value of the current activity, it is inefficient. So speaking to that example, if you are uh, an individual who has, is, is living in an area that has gone a uh, significant urbanization over the past decade, and you continue to hold on to this large piece of land where you farm, and there are condos going up beside you, well, you know, that municipality will change the tax laws, the property tax laws in that area to really capture this change and the urbanization in that area. And so what will happen is they will raise your taxes. And as for you as a farmer, that's a problem because you're being taxed as uh, as someone who lives in that urban area. But, you know, your function to society and what you're doing is completely different from that. And so that's Again, a lack of clarity with regards to, you know, valuing the different pieces of land and the different taxes that are applied to those lands. Another big one is the inheritance tax problem. The death of someone who has been engaging in land intensive activities such as farming poses a spe specific tax problem to those who, who, who inherit the estate. Depending on the size of the estate, the hires who own a considerable will owe a considerable estate tax, a type of tax levied on the value of the assets held by the deceased at the time of death. Since the inherited land may not produce a sufficient cash flow to pay the taxes, part or all of the land may have to be sold to raise the necessary funds. So essentially what this means is that, you know, say, uh, say for example, your grandfather is a farmer. And once again, you know, he's in that area where there's there's uh, been significant urbanization around him, but he's continued to hold on to his farm. The day that he dies, you know, there's a, there's a certain estate tax that you have to pay for, you know, that, that land transfer. The thing is, again, because of that municipality and it's, it's changing tax laws as the region urb becomes more urban, all of a sudden you end up, you know, paying this significant tax bill well before and where in other agricultural areas you wouldn't pay so much. And so you're kind of forced to sell that piece of land even though society might value it and need that piece of land for farming and not, you know, a condo, right? So this is the inheritance tax problem. 
Now, what about market power? The total supply of land is fixed, and in some cases, individuals can have a large influence over a region. One example where this causes problems is when governments attempt to convert private land into public. Suppose, however, the owner of the private land recognizes that his or her ownership of the specific parcel of land must, most suited for this public uh, purpose creates a, an opportunity to become a, a monopolistic seller. To capitalize on this opportunity, he or she could hold out until such time as the public sector paid monopoly profits for the land. So essentially, when it comes to market power, Think about this: when uh, a highway is, when when a uh, government is building a new highway, you know, and they're build, they're they're building these massive pillars on this land. They have to buy up that land. And say, for example, there's this one resident, there's this one homeowner that owns a relatively large piece of land who knows this highway is going to be built here, and they hold out. And this is a clear example. It happens all the time, you know, and they hold out and that's called market power. This is what it's referring to. It's the frustration of public pur purpose. You have society which knows and, and has proven that, you know, this highway is necessary and net overall will increase the total surplus of society. But you have this one individual stopping that from happening. This is market power. Now there's a solution. The main traditional device for controlling the frustration of public purpose problem is a doctrine known as eminent domain. Under eminent domain, the government can legally acquire private property for a public purpose by condemnation as long as the owner is paid just compensation. So essentially, you know, if the government, and it takes a lot of paperwork and all that, but eventually the government will file eminent domain, they'll get someone to value your property, and then they will force you off the property. And of course, this creates a lot of controversy for those who hold out, right? Now, what about are there special problems in developing countries compared to developed markets? Well, of course, the first one, of course, is insecure property rights. There's a lack of clear property rights, which introduces clear equity and efficiency problems. Also, there's the pro poverty problem, which is the degradation of land due to inaccurate investment in maintaining it. It can cause farmers to migrate from the degraded land to other uh, marginal land, only to have it suffer the same fate. So in a lot of developing markets, access to, you know, John Deere equipment or CAD equipment to really farm and grow this farm to efficient levels it's not accessible you know you can't buy that in Zimbabwe you know so what are you going to do there where well, you're going to follow traditional techniques which may hurt the land and so that's the poverty problem also there's government failure which occurs when public policies have the effect of distorting land use allocations so building roads lowers transportation costs and looking back at that bid rent function that flattens the bid rent function and therefore extends the the efficient allocation for that respective piece of you know function further from the urban area and so that occurs through government failure. So what are some proposed solutions to these inefficiencies? Well, there's establishing property rights. The establishment of property rights systems can mitigate or avoid the problems of over-exploitation that can occur when land is merely allocated on a first-come, first-served basis. By est establishing secure, enforceable, transferable claims, adequate property rights systems can encourage both efficient transfer and efficient maintenance of the l value of the land, since in both cases, the seller would benefit directly. So... I mean, focusing in today's world, you know, establishing property rights is it, property rights are quite clear in, in, in the developed markets. Like you own your land, and no one's just going to come out of nowhere and just take that home, right? Unless it's an eminent domain, and that's why there's so many problems with it. But in developing markets, this is still a problem, especially with the government and you know different people who are like, "Hey, that's my piece of land." No, that's my piece of land, right? And so you know that that is an issue. But talking about property rights, and I just want to, because we talked about this early in, in a few earlier videos, when we're talking about property rights, we're essentially saying that efficient allocation comes, say, for example, you know, there's one piece of property, I am the owner, and you are considering this piece of property. Now you value this piece of property at $1 million, I value this piece of property at $800,000. Right? And so net overall, society will benefit if this property is transferred over to you, right? And as long as you pay me less than $1 million for it, you gain from that transfer and society wins as well. So net, you know, I get more money than I initially wanted. So I price it at 800 and you pay me 900,000. So I get a, a nice profit of $800,000 on my evaluation. You get it for a million, $100,000 less than your 
real valuation of $1 million. And so that's property rights. That that transfer and that ability to say that this is my property, if someone else values it more, I can transfer my property to that person because they value it more rather than just the government coming in and saying, I want that property, right? And that's property rights. So there's also transferable development rights, TDR. This is something important. You should know this for your exam. So transferable development rights are programs. Uh, it is a program uh, for a shifting residential development from one portion of a community to another. So local units of government identify sending areas where development is pr prohibited or discouraged and receiving areas where uh, development is encouraged. Landowners seeking to develop in a receiving area must first buy a certain amount of development rights from landowners in a sending area. In principle, the revenue from selling those rights compensates the sending area owners from their inability to develop their land and hence makes more uh, makes them more likely to support the restrictions so let's look at an example first of all why would a government do this well say for example government fears that you know this urbanization in this one respective area it's becoming too dense and it's polluting the area and you know the local sewer sewer systems cannot you know handle that 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 increased demand and that increased amount of people so they're like okay we're going to define you as a sending area we're discouraging development in that area for developers who want to create more condos we're going to identify you know maybe half a kilometer down right down the street that's the receiving area that's where you need to go right but all of a sudden by by stopping development in the sending area, you know, those people lose out on money, right? That's just not fair, you know, and to create that equity, these transferable development rights are they're kind of like permits that are being transferred. So when someone wants to build something in a receiving area, they have to acquire and pay you in the sending area a little bit to compensate you for that, you know, that change in the overall urbanization development region, right? And so that's essentially what I'm seeing on this slide. What about wetlands banking? This is another remedy. So one policy instrument for attempting to preserve wetlands in the face of this pressure is known as wetlands mitigation banking. And it involves providing incentives for creating off-site equivalent wetland services when adverse impacts are unavoidable. Mitigation banks involve wetlands, streams, or other aqu aquatic resource areas that have been restored, established, enhanced, or in certain circumstances, specifically preserved for the purpose of providing compensation for unavoidable impacts to aquatic resources. So let's go back to that example where we we're talking about the farmer and his beautiful vi vistas or, you know, his swamp on the edge of his property. So what, what wetlands banking does is there is a organization that will go to that farmer and a either if they if they decide if the farmer, you know, decides to develop that region, the the organization will look at that and be like, "Okay, this is how big that uh, that marsh is. We're going to replace and in an offsite equivalent create another marsh of the same size somewhere else, therefore offsetting it." Now, is that effective and how and the, really the question is, how has it performed despite policies mandating that habitat trading ensure equivalent value and function, the experience is that most programs are not administered this way. In practice, most habitat trades to date in wetlands programs have been approved on the basis of acres, in many instances ensuring equ equivalence in neither value nor function. So essentially, you know, what a lot of people are doing, they're just cutting corners, as always, because again, in environmental economics, there's always externalities and people will ignore those externalities. And so when they say, okay, you know, we're going to replace that marsh on the side of your property, well, no, we're going to just look at its size and we're going to say, okay, it's, you know, three hectares, you know, three uh, square hectares, and we're going to make create a marsh of three of the size of three square hectares somewhere else, even though it might not be as effective and as important to the ecosystem as the one on the farmer's land. And that's really the problem with wetlands banking. Now, what about con conservation banking? So a conservation bank is a parcel of land containing natural resource values that are conserved and managed in perpetuity through a con conservation easement held by a entity responsible for enforcing the terms of the easement. So banks are established for specific listed species under the Endangered Species Act and used to offset, aka, you know, the offset mitigation impacts to species occurring on non-bank lands. So different from wetlands banking, where essentially you look at the size of that, that uh, marsh and you replace it with conservation banking, you're looking at an existing marsh and you're looking at its existing value and you're saying, okay, 
we're going to protect this one, but somewhere else we're going to develop something of the same size. So instead of, so for, for, for the farmer example, that, that marsh is important. Someone's going to come to him and he's going to be like, look, we're going to protect this because we're replacing a marsh somewhere else. So that's cons conservation banking. Now, banks are established for, speci uh, for speci uh, specified listed uh, species and used to offset impacts to the species occurring on non-bank lands. The values of the natural resources are translated into quantified credits. So project proponents are therefore able to complete their conservation needs through a one-time purchase of credits to the conservation bank. And so that's, you know, they, they make that investment, they protect this, this marsh on the farmer's land, and they can build somewhere else on uh, offsite. There's also safe harbor agreements. A safe ha harbor agreement are a, are a new means of conserving an endangered and threatened species on privately owned land. They overcome the, the, the disincentives that inhibited many landowners from implementing practices likely to benefit endangered species. Safe harbor agreements overcome these uh, perverse incentive problems. Any landowner who agrees to carry out activities expected to benefit an endangered species is guaranteed that no added endangered species act restrictions will be imposed as a result. So essentially, let's look at that farmer. And let's let's assume that that farmer actually knows that that marsh on his land is very important to the local ecosystem. And, you know, a lot of scientists and a lot of researchers have come and spoken to him about the importance and about how much he needs to protect, you know, this certain species, right? And so, you know, it's not legally binding to say that, okay, you know, you need to make these measures and enforce and protect this one fish. But... Again, as conditions worsen, all of a sudden, you might have more species migrating to this one marsh. And so all of a sudden, you have more endangered species, and you have to do more things to protect even more people, or even more species. With a safe harbor agreement, essentially, you're, you're stopping, you're freezing that increasing amount of responsibility. And you're saying, okay, up until this point, I will do everything I can to protect the X amount of species that are right now. If an endangered, another endangered species comes onto my land, I'm not responsible for that because of the safe harbor agreement. And so that kind of incentivizes, for, um, you know, a lot of, of, of private property owners to say, okay, I need to get this right away, make sure that I don't have to like protect like two species. So I don't end up with like 10 species and all of a sudden it costs me a lot of money. Okay. There's also grazing rights. So the Taylor uh, Grazing Act of 1934 attempted to prevent overgrazing by assuring that the amount of grazing was consistent with the carry capacity of the land. The law set up a system that involved the issuance of grazing permits to farmers. Each permit authorized a certain amount of livestock to be grazed on a specific piece of land for a specified period of time. And this essentially says that, you know, if you've ever got, I'm not sure, not really in North America anymore, kind of more in Europe, you'll see that if you're driving alongside the roads in Europe, you always see like, you know, there are these horses and cows and different things kind of grazing land. And, and it's public land. It's not like the owner, like the private owner's land. Well, you know, you can't have everyone going to that piece of land because eventually the grass will die out. It's like an open access resource problem, which we talked about in previous chapters. So what they do is they issue these permits and essentially this is the grazing rights permit. So there are cons conservation easements. A conservation easement is a legal agreement between a landowner and private or public agency that limits uses uh, of the land in order to protect its conservation values. Once created, conservation easements can either be sold or donated. If the donation benefits the public by permanently pr uh, preserving uh, important resources and meets other federal tax code requirements, it can qualify it as a charitable tax deduction. The tax uh, the tax deductible amount is a difference between the land's value with or without the easement. Now, suppose a landowner wants to continue to harvest timber from her land, but not to convert it to housing. In the absence of a conservation easement, the owner is likely to face property um, uh, to face property taxes on the land that are based on the highest valued use development rather than its current use timber harvest. If, however, the owner executes an agreement with a public or private entity that can legally administer a conservation easement on the land, property taxes will fall since the assessed value is now lower. Meanwhile, the land is protected in perpetuity from development and the current owner can use the land for all purposes except those explicitly precluded by the easement agreement. So go back to that example where the farmer uh, has this piece of land and everything around him is uh, is growing it's you know there's a lot of urbanization around and all of a sudden the municipality changes the tax code and he's paying more taxes with the conservation easement he can go back to the initial tax code for his farm but he signs an agreement that says okay if 
if you're going to get that tax deduction, if you're going to get that tax reduced, then you need to make sure that you're protecting this and using it only for what you're using it right now, which is farming. And of course, in efficient ways. Now, there's also land trust, and this is probably something you'll talk about in your class. So who oversees the easement agreements? Well, legal entities known as conservation land trusts, which are nonprofit organizations that actively work to conserve land using a variety of means. And so essentially, these land trusts, either they through donation money or through some rich billionaire who, you know, started up a land trust, they use money and, you know, they they financially commit and acquire either private land or they help with uh, other private land owners and they help them protect their land and r really set up these con conservation easements okay now of course there's valuing the ecosystem the ecosystem goods and services so we talked about one of the efficiencies is undervaluing the environmental amenities but one prominent example of really valuing the environmental amenities is through ecotourism and so environmentally responsible travel to na natural areas in order to enjoy and appreciate nature that promotes conservation has a low visitor impact and provides for beneficially active social economic involvement of local peoples so if you again and going back to that farm with the beautiful vistas if he you know kind of builds maybe a, he builds a website and he's like look check this out check out my beautiful farm i offer tours and all that kind of stuff then that is considered ecotourism and actually i'm not sure if anyone's a fan of the office the tv show you know there's dwight dwight has that uh what dwight schrute farm he has that you know horticulture you know like that that big farm that he tours and he has housing on that's part of ecotourism he essentially you know, tours people on this big farm and in a way it helps value the ecosystem of those of those goods and services other than that there's the b development impact fees so going back to that public infrastructure problem with development impact fees there are charges imposed on a developer to offset the additional public service costs of new development normally applied at the time of a de developer receiving a building permit the revenues are dedicated to funding the additional services such as water and sewer systems roads schools libraries parks and recreation facilities made necessary by the presence of new residents in the development internalizing that in externality restores the incentives associated with choosing the location of residential development and reduces one distortion that promotes inefficient leapfrogging, leapfrogging and sprawling. And so that essentially steepens the, the bid rent function and brings the development closer to the, uh, to the urban center and prevents that leapfrogging that occurs when you know, developers don't account for you know, the public costs of development. There's also property tax adjustments. So several states offer programs to dis discount property taxes as a means to protect a socially desired current use. Particularly when undiscounted taxes are seen as an inefficient bias against the, that use. When property taxes are used upon market value, rather than uh, current use, the tax structure can, be, can put pressure on that owner to convert the land. So that example with the farm and the urban area. Now under schemes to try to counteract this tax bias, eligible property owners seen as conferring uncompensated external benefits on the community are offered specific reductions in their assessed value. And this takes a lot of time, of course, because there's a lot of bureau bureaucratic different, um, you know, steps that you need to go through and say, oh, you know, well, I'm going to use this land for farming, I'm not going to like sell it and all that kind of stuff. Eventually, you'll get that property tax reduction. Oh, other than that, we're pretty much it for this chapter. As always, please check the, the video description for a link to the Amazon page where you can buy the environmental and natural resource uh, book by Tom Tiedenberg. And if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to the channel for more videos. Um, if you have any comments, any questions, please comment below and I'll be sure to get back to you as soon as possible. And good luck with your exams, guys. Have a great day.